inside the Gamecocks the show. Welcome back. Built by the Barndo Co., the national anthem. Plays at noon every day. And thanks to our friends at Palm Casual who helped present that. PalmCasual.com. Make your outdoors the best that it could possibly ever be. Uh, Pat, we know Aaron Beasley very, very well. He's he's the best salesman on the planet, but at least he sells the best products on the planet. Mike's got him on his back porch, just like we do. Palmcasual.com. Yeah, man. Go ahead. Yeah, Weezy pimped out uh, our back patio. So hey, you didn't you didn't text us back. Weezy wanted to send you a picture of us at his party this weekend. No response. Uh, Ghosted us. Come on, man. Guilty. You 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 know you blasted me in front of however many listeners. Well, I was waiting. I was waiting for this moment. I gave you all the way till (laughs) noon on Monday. Forty-eight hours. I read it too, and I read it. I was at a crazy. Yep, you're missing a hell of a party. Well, uh, yep. a baby party, I'm sure, was a hell of a party. <laughs> Don't yeah. have charge. Sorry. It's all, yeah, it's all good, man. You know, we uh, – so, hi, guys, it, it, welcome, everybody. Mike Morgan is here. JC is here. Uh, Pat is here. This Our family just grew during the break. So, I, I came up with an idea. All right, let me get everybody's thoughts on this. Phil, maybe you've done this before. I don't know. Pat, I know you've done it. Uh, maybe not what I'm about to tell you, but I know you've carved pumpkins with your children. Uh-huh. And oh, let's be honest, carving pumpkins kind of sucks. Kind of sucks. Um, my kids refuse to use the little cookie cutters. You know, you just hammer them through, and the eyes come out and everything. No, no, no. We got to go through the whole cutting yeah. process. So we did that at Weasel or at Aaron at Aaron's on uh, Saturday, and. But we live in the South, so they're not going to last till Halloween on Thursday, right? They're going to start to smell, and they start to crumble, and the bugs get it. You know how it works, right? Yeah. So I said, well, I'm not doing this crap again. I'm not carving any more pumpkins before Halloween just so we can put candles in them like the kids want. So I put those sons of bitches in the deep freezer. So they (laughs) are frozen in the bottom of my freezer, (laughs) and I will pull them out on Halloween night. It put candles. Has anybody done that, or am I in a league of my own here? I am going to be – you'll have to, like – I feel like that's not a good thing to do. I feel like what? they're going to – Why? Like, like the, they're going to melt a little bit, and, like, just the nastiness of the inside of a pumpkin is going to be even nastier than it should be. And yeah. I don't know. Let me know how I, it goes. Like, dude, I, only, Pat, I think these things are going to, like – gonna melt because you know Wait, it, the water in the pumpkin is gonna expand and it's gonna destroy the structural integrity of the cellular structure of the pumpkin itself You're gonna have all this water at the bottom of it once it finally thaws out well look man i only need them to last for like three hours on thursday night like they'll still be thawing by the time we get home from trick-or-treating right there you go I think the the rot and decay kind of adds to the fun. I mean, you know, it is Halloween. It's all about, you know, mess. I mean, well, you know, but mess that's easily contained and not, you know, dripping out of the pumpkin. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, that's all right. But that's why we're cutting ours like tonight, maybe tomorrow for that yeah. exact reason. Like we wait because we have to wait, man. The no. humidity and the heat just sucks it out of them. Anyways, whatever. I'm sure nobody really cares anymore about that. All right, Pat, uh, Carolina this weekend, uh, uh, they didn't lose, which is neat, and uh, they've got a chance to win a big one on Saturday night as the Aggies come to town. It's a 7.30 kick on ABC. Uh, what did you think about a ms 31-point performance in the second half against LSU Saturday evening? Yeah, I mean, one thing that jumped out to me was just how how explosive they are and how athletic they are. Um, I mean, Preseason, I don't think anybody had very big hypes for A and M. Um, and then week one, they lose to Notre Dame. Um, they've kind of had a weird up and down season. I mean, they I feel like there was another opponent I was looking at, like they beat McNeese State or somebody or Bowling Green State by like six points. Um, but then they Bowling beat Missouri Green. the following week, forty-one to six. Um, it's just a very, very Carolina. Ask where they've played good at times and they haven't played good at times. Um, but except you won them all, yeah. I mean, but they're six and one or seven and one. And, um, what what has jumped out to me is I think Carolina can put an extra guy in the box to stop the run from quarterback run to run game. Generally, they have 21 rushing touchdowns and like seven or eight passing touchdowns. So make them throw it over your head, make them beat you in the air. It's a great point. I, 
it's it's hard to imagine this game being decided. I mean, it really, I, I mean, almost like we're having this conversation every week. Now that Carolina's got the dudes on the defensive line, it just feels like another trenches week here. A and M's defensive line is is outstanding. South Carolina's defensive line is outstanding. Probably going to see two freshman quarterbacks in the game. I mean, I. I know that the records are a little bit different, but it seems like a couple of teams that kind of are mirror images of each other. Uh, Pat, yeah, I think that's a great assessment. I mean, we're we've talked about it for three or four weeks now. Carolina's a couple of plays away from being six and one, and same situation as a And M, top ten in the country. Um, and you know, this is a really good chance to play a really good Texas A and M football team that is getting better each week. I would argue that. South Carolina is getting better each week, too, coming off a bye. Um, so it's going to be – I mean, nobody knows better than everybody listening here that williams Bryce Stadium on a night game, uh, prime time, is an electric environment. It's going to be a very hard place to play. So uh, the fan base, I know, is going to be rocking and rolling. If it's, if it's anything like LSU, which was about a noon kick um, in williams Bryce Stadium – it's going to be absolutely mayhem for a and to come into. And last time they were here, didn't XL shove it 105 or 102 yards right at the rear end? So Yeah. He, um, well, he caught that kickoff, and he took his shoe off. Remember, he took it off, he threw it in the stands and flipped them the bird, and then he ran down the sideline. Yeah, well, it's easy for first-rounders to do that. It was pretty cool. Yeah, that was, that was neat. Uh, no, his right shoe fell off as he ran past the Aggie sideline and and out of like three or four tackles over there too, yeah. Uh, you were you were you were on staff for that. I'm sure you remember it quite well. No, yes. No. All right. So let's talk about the, Aggie, the Aggies' quarterbacks, guys. Um, you know, Wegman, we've seen him. He, he's whatever, and he's an average guy. Uh, yeah. Reed is electric, but but yeah. I don't I don't know. Like Pat, you, well, I'm gonna let you take it from there. I I don't know if he's a four quarter. He's going to, if he start, I don't know if he'll start, not start. I'm not even sure any of us will know until late Saturday afternoon, Saturday evening. Uh, but I, I think Carolina is certainly preparing for, for both quarterbacks. Uh, what, what, what'd you, what have you seen? What do you like out of those guys? What type of challenges do they present to the Carolina defense? Yeah. I mean, I agree The the Wegman kid is kind of, he's not going to lose games for you, but he's not going to do what, Marcel Reed does and, and take over a game and have the electric plays um, that we saw him at. I mean, it was the second half of of the LSU game was really impressive. I mean, he, I don't look for statistically, but he probably averaged 10. And just the second half that I watched, he averaged 10 yards of carry, had two or three explosive plays. Um, it was impressive. I mean, we're probably – I mean, we have really athletic linebackers, though, to kind of offset that stuff, so – um, not to mention our safeties, you know, can play in the box and, and do all that good stuff too. So it, it's going to be a challenging matchup from, from either of the standpoint because they have athletes all over the place. I mean, the running back almost has 800 yards rushing already this year, averaging over 100 yards a game. So um, we're going to have our hands full, but we, good thing we have a arguably the best defense in the country. Um, so when we go – True. Good on good. I think our defensive line matches up really get really well against their run game. Um, and, you know, just put the ball down, line up, and see how we play. Yeah, Reed, uh, he only threw it twice in the game the other night. Nine carries, I think, like 65, 70 yards or something. For what it's worth, Wegman uh, did play in that game you were talking about a couple of years ago when Carolina finally got their first win against the Aggies. Eight of 15 for 91 yards uh, through the air. and. Um, in that in that loss yeah what is the key to stopping a guy like marcel reed pat carolina's defense up front we we know it's elite you got those edge rushers that they, they try to get up field in a hurry don't they so so how how does an offense try to get around like what is, what will a m do to combat that and what does south carolina how, how do they slow that down a guy like marcel reed who his his legs really do i mean they move i mean he's an electric kid I mean, I think one of the – I think shifts in, like, us stemming and motioning pre, pre-snap pre will will mess with some of his reads, especially in the in the zone read, read option stuff. Um, I think multiple formations from a defensive standpoint, uh, you know, being 4-2-5, going 3-3-5, stemming to a bear at times, um, giving him different stuff to look at to make him think about stuff. I mean, obviously we know – 
from an athlete standpoint, he's really good. Let's see if he can think and adjust and, and make the reactions that he needs to make to, to go out there and execute. Um, but I think what we've done to everybody so far this year defensively is put pressure on them. Um, and that's pass game, run game. I mean, if you're running zone read and Dylan Stewart is running at your face at 20 miles an hour, which is just a moderate speed for him, um, you got to make a decision really fast and hopefully you make the right one. And if you don't, then that ball's probably on the ground. That's the beauty on the triple option zone read is there's a lot of ball handling stuff. And when pressure's on your face and you have to make a decision a lot faster than you'd like, uh, bad stuff happens. So uh, I, I foresee us getting after him, putting pressure on him, putting an extra guy in the box. Um, and I mean, you, you basically know if you're crashing, like if the DN crashes on his own replay, like the backer's scraping. So just making sure our backers are are not giving him enough space to make the miss. So just react super fast. And, you know, if it is a pull read for the quarterback to make sure you're scraping right there to don't don't put yourself in a vulnerable situation where he has seven or eight yards to get, get steam rolling at you and have a two-way go. Let's flip it to the other side of the field. The Aggies – 92nd in the nation in pass defense, giving up almost 240 yards a game through the air. Uh, we know Lenar Sellers can throw can throw it. He can he can sling it around. Um, but Carolina has got to run the football, Pat. And and both yep. of these teams are very similar in stopping the run. Game got 16th in the nation. Aggies are 18th in the nation. Mm -hmm. Offensively, uh, it, knowing what A and M presents, especially up front, they're they're a little loose in the secondary, but up front they're yep. elite. What, yeah, what, what, I mean, yeah. Go ahead. I think it's a, it's the same story on both ends. I think they're going to try to pressure the Norse and make him get it out early, make him make decisions, um, and not get comfortable back there in the pocket. Um, I've been very, I mean, I I'm a Lenore Sellers fan um, as a person, as a football player. I think he's developing right on par with with how I was expecting him to um, as a redshirt freshman. Um, so I mean, I I, I think. If, if we can sit there and establish the run early um, and make them put that extra guy in the box, which I don't, I, I would imagine they're probably going to do from, from the get go. Um, I think this is an opportunity for us to really attack the perimeter of these teams. I and mean, we talked about, it, I think last week, we haven't, we haven't run many bubble screens out wide. We haven't run many RPOs. Um, I think it's an opportunity for us to get there. We have small receivers that are athletic, and obviously we've seen they're, they're good with the ball in their hands. Um, you know, as, if, as long as we can block on the perimeter, I think this is a week where we can kind of get after them out there. So uh, I think that's a good way to get Lenore's confident. It's an extension of the run game. Um, and eventually that kind of opens up shots. So that's what I'd like to see. You say, okay, I want to get you to give us a little bit more information when you say things. We hear it all the time. Establish the run game. Establish the run game. Establish the run game. I think a lot of people think that that means that, you know, at the end of the night, Carolina should have, you know, six yards per carry, 200 yards on the ground. That's not exactly what that means. Like, what does establishing the run game early in a ball game do for an offense? And describe it a little bit more in depthly. Yeah, I mean, I – just imposing your will and, and like winning the line of scrimmage. That's a, that's something that if, if, if you win a football game, you generally establish the line of scrimmage and kind of set the tone. Um, I mean, shoot, if you average six yards a carry, you're going to, you should go 11 and one. <laughs> like, like that's unheard of. Um, well, that's like we, when I was in Atlanta and we had a really good run game under Kyle Shanahan, our, our goal was to average four and a half yards of carry. And that doesn't come like it's not like first first and second down, it's automatically going to be third and one. No, that's like you gain two and then you gain 12, and then you gain six, and then you gain one, and then you have minus two. It's more about committing to it and telling yourself, hey, we're going to run the ball at least 25. Lord willing, if the game plan allows us to, if we're on schedule, we're going to run the ball 25 to 30 times a game. You know, we want to have a blend of duo, zone read, wide zone, mid zone, whatever your expertise is. Um, but just making sure, like, in your first 25 plays, like, I, I think Dow has done a really good job um, in games where the offense has clicked of really dialing it up and having a really good scheme starting out of the game and the guys were confident going at it. So really – you know, sticking to the 
sticking to your best plays and, and like Coach Spurrier was always a repeat play caller, repeat play caller. And if stuff works, don't run away from it. Dive into it more. Make them right. stop. It. Yes, hundred percent. Uh, you and know, I, I think that guy, like just run that like fifty times a game. You'll gain. You'll have sixty yards of total offense, um, but you'll run a lot of the clock. Yeah, we didn't really invite you here to advocate for the fullback, um, <laughs> but I understand what you're saying since you hey, won. I bought Nate Atkins with the touchdown uh, yesterday. Yeah, yeah, That's awesome, mm-hmm. man. I know we yeah. mentioned that earlier. Uh, it's so so proud of him. What a what a football player. I mean, Kids. he um, like now we're talking. Now we're talking fullback, tight end, H back. <laughs> Now you're talking my language, guys. <laughs> well, playing yeah. off what you just said, Pat, what is what's the best running scheme for Carolina this year? Um, I mean, zone read. Obviously, if you have you know, Rocket is is a threat in himself, and then Lenore and Robbie Ashford. I mean, both have both have decent legs. So, I mean, I would say some sort of zone read. I mean, Lenore's popped one for seventy five on Q power, um, with jet motion, um, you know, rocket took one 75 and I think that was a duo, which is essentially gap scheme, tight zone, however you uh, different blocking schemes, but they all look the same, but some way to make the defense have to have an extra guy in the box to, to respect it and, you know, give those guys a chance to make somebody miss in space. I mean, I love the, I love the perimeter game. I love, trying to make corners tackle corners don't want to tackle um and that requires a receiver cracking a safety a receiver coming down in the box and digging out a, a nickel um but i think when we have those two guys when we have quarterback run when we have the option of quarterback run and obviously running back run that's where we're most dangerous offensive line has been the same every week this this year from a starters standpoint uh i i I don't know if we'll see any changes or or not uh, this coming weekend, but um, they are 133rd in the country in in sacks allowed, which is dead last. Pat, so you know, I, I do, mean, do you, pass him, spit it, get it out of his hand. Don't yeah, don't have a 15, 20 yard pass route. I mean, short intermediate routes give the quarterback confidence, give your playmakers a chance with the ball in their hands to go make somebody miss. I mean, that's. Like I, I've said this several times, but Devontae Freeman, like first and second driving games, he would get so pissed off because he didn't have an explosive run yet. And I'm like, dude, we're we're, we're these are body shots. We're just we're we're punching the defense in, in the kidneys and and the in the chest and the shoulders. We're wearing them out right now. And big explosive ones are coming. Like just keep plugging along. Don't get frustrated. Don't get upset. But it's the same thing with the pass game. I mean, you throw a stick route, a stick route, the backers and trail them, and you miss the tackle, and then the Tight ends one on one with the with the safety and there's nobody else. Like if, if you get the ball, if the if you get your playmakers the ball in space, let them let them make plays. Like trust their legs. So I would like to see some perimeter action, spit it out wide. Um, I'd like to see some RPO reading the backside linebacker on a on a on a mid zone. And if the backside linebacker chases the run, have number two run a quick glance um, and get them a chance to get that ball with some space to make that safety miss. Pat DeMarco joining us, 1223. Go ahead, Mike. Yeah, I, I was just going to ask a, a question about how you might think this goes down if a certain thing goes down. Like, I'm looking at LSU's backs against AM. and They're pretty good backs. Will we all agree on that? I mean, mm-hmm. you know, the, the, yeah, the Dunham right. kid is pretty good and the Williams kid. Uh, collectively, they averaged under two yards a carry against AM's defense. A&M has been one of the best rushing teams all year long, but I really think both of these defenses can jam up the other's running game. Like mm-hmm. I, Carolina's defense is far superior to LSU's. Mm-hmm. Um, and But as JC pointed out this morning, like A&M's run game is a little bit different and superior to what Carolina's seen most of this year. So if it's a stalemate, right, if, if – a lot of body shots. You still got to do that. I, I see what you're yeah. saying there. But let's just say like, nobody really is able to just gash the other. How do you see the game unfolding? Who does it favor? Um, what, what do you see the game looking like if neither one is able to impose its will just just running all over the other? Um, 
I mean, I I was just looking at AM's like what some of their statistical receivers have done. I mean, they have a lot of big plays, 58 yards, 73 yards, 58, or another 58, 40, 38. I mean, they have a lot of guys who have made big plays. Granted, I haven't watched that much Texas A&M besides the second half of last week. Um, but it looks like their guys can can make plays with the ball in their hands after they catch it. Um, you know, our, I wouldn't say – not that our receivers aren't stellar, but we I feel like they haven't had enough opportunities to go out there and show themselves. Um, so, I mean, looking at us, like the biggest play that we've had is 44 yards, um, a lot of 30s, a lot of 20s. Um, but we got a lot of guys that can – that are nifty with the ball in their hands. I mean, Jacobs, Gage, I mean, Nick Harbour, we've seen him have a few explosive plays. Mazio, Mazio's uh, shown that he can do some stuff. You know, I, I, th- I think a way that we can kind of separate here is to get Rocket Sanders involved in the past game. Run a couple, like, you know, slow down the rush, soften the defense up, throw a few running back screens and, and kind of an extension of the run game there, um, but allowing their aggressive defensive front to get upfield, sneak on the backside and, um, you know, get a cheap one that way. I mean, yeah. even like Josh Simon's big catch um, – against uh oklahoma that was an extension of the run game it was based off a triple act triple option type play run action fake the sweep kind of like a bluff bluff that safety release down i mean that's all stuff that if you scheme up and the timing is on i mean that stuff's that stuff's rock solid well i think i i think what mike is saying not only is it right i think it's it's absolutely going to be true on saturday night i don't think either one of these teams are going to go out there and just be eight, eight guys in the box almost every single play right um, yeah. So it's it's whoever I mean it's all it's going to be matchup based and whether you can make your guy miss like um, mm-hmm. we used to do it with Julio all the time we used to call him now routes um, just spit it to him right now and let him let him go one on one with the corner and more often than not Julio made that corner look like a fool um, and the rest was history so um, yeah, letting these guys make plays in space. That's that's what this game's gonna be about, especially because it's gonna be in between the hashes, it's gonna be jam packed. There's gonna be uh sixteen bodies in there. Um and then out wide, let's see what we can do. If they can hold up front, Carolina I'm talking about here, A and M is prone to giving up some some deep ones. Again, ninety second in the nation and passing yards allowed. Maybe this is Lenora Sellers' breakout night when it comes to tossing it downfield. Speaking of Lenora Sellers, Mr. DeMarco, mm. don't we have something coming up on Wednesday? Yes, we had uh we had the we had the luxury of having QB1, um present day QB1, not Stephen Garcia QB1, <laughs> or Connor Shaw QB1, of present day QB1 on the podcast uh coming up this week. And man, he is a he is a sharp young man. Um was impressed in all facets. He was there 10 minutes early, uh, asked to review kind of some of the questions. Like he is just a, he is a, he's a stellar kid. Um, and I, not just saying that because he's on the podcast, but he is just very responsible. He had an NIL event after our event, but he, you know, as we were finishing up, he's like, Hey, I got an extra 30 minutes. If you guys want to go through anything else. Um, so, Love that kid. Think he's going to play his ass off on Saturday. Um, super glad he's in Garnet and Black. We talked about his recruiting, um, hmm. the recruiting process, and you know, being from he's South Florence um, and what it meant to stay home and what this state means to him, what this program means to him. So, um, if you haven't listened to our show yet, what the hell are you doing? First of all, but do check it out. It's on Apple, Spotify, Gamecox Plus, Chief Sports Network. There's a lot of ways to listen to it. So if you're not, if if you're listening to inside the Gamecocks, there's no reason why you shouldn't be listening to tailgate talks. I mean, Stephen Garcia is on here for God's sake. The guy's a lot more entertaining than me. Um, yep. So drinks a lot of booze. Big, that's the first big plug I've done for our show on this show. You you've teed me up, but I've run away from it, JB. So I first I finally plugged it. I know you got to run to it. You got to run yeah. to the light. Yeah, don't, be af- don't be don't be afraid, Pat. Don't be afraid. Run into the light, man. You can do it. Um, 
Well, hey, look, man, great stuff as always. Really looking forward to uh, to Wednesday morning to to getting a chance. I have not had a chance to preview any of this, so I'm looking forward to myself getting to, getting to listen to Lenore sit there and talk to you and and Stephen. That's going to be a lot of fun. Um, and Saturday night, hopefully, is going to be a lot of fun as well as Carolina welcomes the Aggies back to town and looks for their fifth win of the year. Before we get you out of here, got a hat tip to the Buffalo Bills, 6-2 and two after spanking the Seahawks yesterday. You got to be proud of your boys. You're going to get up there and see them play soon? Yeah, Weston and I are going up with a couple friends here in Columbia up to the um, Bills 49ers game, Sunday night football, nice. December 1st. So we went last year for a Thursday night football. Actually, it was last week um was a little flashback one year ago you were up there and it was like 65 degrees so it was weird i made sure this year we're go if we're gonna go experience buffalo we're gonna freeze our asses off and it might be miserable outside for three or four hours but we're gonna be coming back to columbia south carolina and it's not that bad there so we're going up there and obviously gonna see debo um you're gonna see a heck of a game i mean two two teams that are gonna be playing in the playoffs um when push comes to shove in in january so Weston's really excited. Shoot, I'm excited. Um, it's uh, I mean, if you haven't experienced, I mean, not many people have it in South Carolina have experienced a game in Buffalo, New York, but it is a, it is a must do. Tailgating scene's awesome. Um, food's awesome. It is like SEC football on steroids. Um, so bills are rolling, and then, um, but actually, actually, this week. Weston and I are going to Atlanta, my other team, the Atlanta Falcons, who are rolling to now, now leading the division. Um, they play the Cowboys this upcoming Sunday, and Weston and I are going to that game. So we're Weston nice. and I are traveling. We're going. I wonder how many Cowboy fans there'll be in attendance at that game. Probably about 30,000. Yeah. I mean, how did the Falcons – what happened against the Seahawks, man? <laughs> I um, mean, that was th – this team's so inconsistent. I, I, as soon as I think they're going to, you know, I mean, they're going to win that division probably, but as soon as I think that, you know, I don't know. Uh, that, that game made me mad. Anyway. Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, Kirk's playing well. Um, and then, yeah. obviously, the run game with Bijan and Algier. Um, yeah. Defense is hit or miss, though. It's, um, it's been strange. They're either on or they're, not, or they're not. They've had, you know, unfortunately for the Bucks, they've had two – extremely large injuries last week, which kind of freed up the division for, for our Falcons. So, but no, excited to get back to, I didn't, I didn't get the luxury of playing. I played in the Georgia dome, not the Mercedes Benz dome. Um, it's like staying, I guess like staying at the holiday Inn express or Ritz Carlton. Um, <laughs> hey, I like the holiday Inn express. Yeah. No, I mean, for, for, for <laughs> it's great. Uh, I'm not putting the robe yeah. on at the Holiday Inn Express, though. <laughs> yeah, I don't think they have robes there. Uh, <laughs> it's like patio furniture from Amazon Prime versus Palm Casual. Yeah, well, there, there you go. go. Much better. Okay. The season vet. That's how you do it. That's how you do it. <laughs> that's that's how you Pat, it's, it's all a lesson. Everything everything we do here is part this of This is how you do it without offending people, Pat. Listen to the pro. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, Pat, as, as someone who lives in Atlanta and watches that Falcon team and uh, occasionally has to talk about them on 680, uh, this is what happened. You mentioned the defense. What happens when you spend four consecutive years with top 10 picks and you keep going offense, including yep. drafting a backup quarterback, and you don't address at all the defense? No pass rush. It's the same old story around here. Like yeah. you know, a lot of toys on offense, not a lot on D. Yeah, it's uh, unfortunately, I think they're going to make, or fortunately, unfortunately, however you want to put it, they're going to make the playoffs. So they're going to have a worse draft pick this year. Yeah. Um, but free agency, uh, I mean, we, uh, from a cap standpoint, I'm not sure how much free money we're <laughs> going to have out there either. Um, but I mean, and you think about defensively, I mean, the two linebackers, what is it, Anderson, and what's the other kid's name? Um, uh, Ellis. Yeah, yeah, linebackers. They uh, took white linebackers, too, which is pretty I, I, yeah, abnormal. I, I know um, exactly. He's actually done pretty well. They both have played well. No, yeah, I agree. yeah, and Jared on the line is fine, you know, but the secondary is not great. and, and they it's There's just no game. outside pass rush. You, you've had every opportunity to draft one, and they just don't do it. They don't address it. They got the Uda guy from New England. He's been a mm -hmm. bust. Like, it's just same old, same old. They'll win the worst division in football. They'll go to the postseason, and then they'll get bounced early, and like you said, they'll no longer have a high draft pick.
I mean, Kyle Pitts, look at two touchdowns this past week. Yeah, Rick he flashes, man. And and you remember, he was an alien in college. He was right. undefendable, but he just – there are days he shows up, and the other days he looks like he's not motivated. I, in, I inconsistent ball skills for sure Yeah, um, with him. But when, when he does have the ball in his hands, he's out running corners and safeties, which is pretty freaky to do for he a tight end. He can be a dude. It yeah, be a dude. And by the way, I, to your other team, I I can watch Josh Allen every week. I I just he is he is freak. Yes, absolutely He's special. Freak. Um, yeah. Somebody, oh, actually, Garcia was texting me, and he's like, "Hey, who's a Hall of Famer, Matt Ryan or Josh Allen?" Um, hmm. I was like, probably Josh. I mean, if Josh can win a Super Bowl, um, which I think is definitely on the table for Buffalo. I mean, Josh is. His stats blow away um, Lamar Jackson's. Lamar Jackson's just been on a couple better teams. Um, I mean, not taking it away from Matt Ryan, who was a stud and top 10 in passing yards in his career and all these other things. But, I mean, Josh has a, more rushing touchdowns than probably most running backs. And, and Matt had Julio and Roddy White and Tony Gonzalez, and Josh Allen had – a prima donna undersized guy and Stefan Diggs and a lot of just scrap heap guys with all yep. due respect, you know, to Gabe Owen. Like they they need to, to draft a stud wide out. Keon Coleman, they're hoping will be that guy, but he's coming around, yeah. Yeah. Coming around. Uh this year, uh, Josh Allen, by the way, 14 touchdowns. One in the he, yeah. he got yeah. rid of the yeah. turnover bug. That was the one thing that people would knock him for. Yeah, he's yeah. he's actually cleaned it up. So. It's pretty neat to see how how loved he is in Laramie, Wyoming. I sat in his locker, as a matter of fact. Uh, he he, yeah. he does a lot for little old Laramie, Wyoming, where he played his college ball. Josh um, Pat, we'll let you run, man. Uh, always thankful. Can't wait for Wednesday. You, Stephen, Lenoris, tailgate talks on the Chief app, and then next Monday we'll recap what hopefully is a Carolina victory over the Aggies. Thanks, brother. Yep. See y'all. You the man. Thanks, there you go. The great Pat DeBarco.